In 1797, Thomas Jefferson became the first president of the American Philosophical Society and is credited as the most instrumental person in the development of paleontology as a science and in the recognition of Big Bone as an important paleontological site. President Thomas Jefferson wrote the first monograph in, uh, in, uh, on described in detail uh, the anatomy of the bones and stuff for a giant ground sloth, Megalonyx. He was very interested in fossils from the very beginning. And he'd heard all kinds of uh, rumors about uh, Big Bone Lick. Interesting thing was that Thomas Jefferson was so excited about the uh, Indian legend about these animals going over this hill. It's still called Mastodon Hill to this day. They were probably mammoths, though. American Philosophical Society uh, did uh, give me personally uh, one of the teeth that was collected uh, there. The Indians uh, uh, told uh, these early explorers uh, down there that yes, their great, great, great grandparents had seen these animals. They could find these bones all over because they were washing out there. Uh, there were so many of them. Uh, they drew pictures with a trunk and all. Oh yes, they went over the hill. So Thomas Jefferson financed the expedition for Lewis and Clark to go and see if the animals were still alive. But they had been exterminated at least 10,000 years. But that's how legends could be carried out. They could even draw the trunk and everything. They passed it on from one generation to the other. A few years after the most famous 1803 Lewis and Clark Western Expedition, Jefferson commissioned Clark to return to Big Bone to collect bones Clark saw on his earlier trip. Although Clark did not record any live sightings, over 300 bones of mammoths, mastodons, and other mammals were sent to Jefferson in Washington via the Mississippi and the Atlantic Ocean. Once in Washington, the bones were studied by Jefferson and later sent to the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia and others to the National Institute of France. Jefferson kept a number of bones for his private collection at Monticello in Virginia. Between the time of Thomas Jefferson's era and the early 1960s, little is known about other expeditions and fossil finds at Big Bone Lick. It is known that the area also attracted people by the thousands for the Salt and Sulphur Springs. Very early people were here and discovered it, you know, in the very earliest part of the exploration in Kentucky. And, and so, and then the early pioneers were here gathering salt. And then they, and then they built a hotel as a health spa and uh, operated a few years and then the Civil War came along It closed up for the Civil War and was never a successful venture after that. Due to his own personal education, Dr. Bertland Schultz became fascinated about Thomas Jefferson's writings on Big Bone. For nearly 30 years, he made several trips to Big Bone, Kentucky. Then in 1960, it looked as though a major dig could be done. But uh, up till that time, uh, no one knew anything about uh, Big Bone Lake because even though uh, uh, <clears throat> Harvard University had, uh, uh, had uh, collected uh, earlier, uh, had collected uh, 92 boxes of fossils, but no one ever kept any provenience on anything. In 1959, Ellis Crawford, curator of the Barringer Museum of Covington, Kentucky, had some record finds as he was known to visit several historical sites in northern Kentucky. That's right. He obtained permission from some of the uh, property owners down there at the time uh, before it was public property uh, to do some initial uh, test trenches and things like that, especially along the banks of the creek system down there. Uh, and he found a variety of things. Uh, some things actually he was tipped off to by the writings of uh, William Barringer, who in early uh, forays into the Big Bone Lick area found some of the iron pots and so forth from the salt licks of the historic period, uh, as well as one or two fossils. And then when uh, Ellis Crawford got into that area, he also took some young volunteers with him who would later help on those excavations uh, with U.S. Geological Survey and uh, the University of Nebraska. But they found some very nice uh, pieces, including Equus complicatus, the early uh, form of the horse that's now extinct, uh, the uh, many different types of bison, uh, the uh, Wapiti elk pieces, woolly mammoth, mastodon. 
The mastodon jaw was probably the most spectacular piece that they found even before the excavations with the University of Nebraska, uh, the full bottom jaw. This extraordinary find prompted Crawford to get the word out to known experts in the country to come to Kentucky to perform a scientific dig to turn up more fossils under the earth at Big Bone Lick. Ellis uh, communicated with many of the top archaeologists and paleontologists of the day and that helped uh, build not only his reputation uh, in those fields but also uh, build a case for uh, the top research people in the country to come here to Northern Kentucky to perform those scientific excavations. And they were here for four or five years, and that's a pretty substantial commitment to that site. Well, Ellis Crawford is the one that uh, invited us down because we met him and had known his family real well over the years that Mary and I were there, and he always wanted to dug, and they had a national meeting in Lincoln, and so uh, we were able to get the money to uh, go there for a five-year period, and uh, the anthropology crew were all from the University of Kentucky. The uh, geology crew and invertebrate crew were from the University of Cincinnati, and, uh, and the vertebrate paleontologists and some of the geologists were from Mars, and they were students, mostly. Randy Cochran was one of the teenage workers on the site. Several years before the Big Bone dig, Randy would help Ellis Crawford at the museum and on other area digs. This experience alone helped as he built a close relationship with Ellis Crawford. I was here the first two years of the dig, and really the first year I was one of the first, first people in here before the Nebraska came, and um, we started probably a month or two before that. Uh, at, at the time, I believe there was just two of us on the payroll. Well, one of them is, is Jerry Scheiber, who's now a PhD with in geology. Uh, at the time was working on his, his degree and, and myself who was just out of high school and the first thing we did was to uh, to, to work on a map of, of the area, a one foot contour map, which a big part of that first summer and especially the pre-dig uh, was, was to map it so that we could document it. We we, we found some benchmarks that, that told us what the above sea level we were and then we shot in for those and put a bunch of benchmarks all over the area and from there we drew a one foot contour map including the area we stand on. And then the University of Nebraska came along and, and we had some bulldozers and some other equipment which was furnished by the state of Kentucky which we used to, to remove uh, overburden which is the soil over top of the layer of bones that we were interested in, in digging. With equipment in place and the country's leading experts on site, Randy remembers the first day of this major big bone dig. Well, we were all real excited. Uh, we thought that sort of as soon as you stuck the bulldozer in the ground, we were going to start running into things. And I think we found as much as 14 foot of a fairly recent overburden. At that level, we even discovered bricks and signs of, you know, recent historic things because it turns out that apparently during the 37 flood, there was a tremendous amount of silt deposited in this location we were digging. There's been a great debate about exactly where to start digging. Uh, the University of Nebraska wanted to dig there, and Alice thought we ought to be digging someplace else. But yeah, I was going to ask you, who made that actual decision? The University of Nebraska made that decision, Schultz and Company, and, 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 and I think maybe part of it was it was convenience. <laughs> it was a fairly easy spot to get to, and Alice had always thought we should be digging across the creek, where in later years is where they ended up finding some more, more major finds. 